Hello everyone, how's it going? Welcome back to another episode of the Weekly Poker Showdown brought to you by Party Poker. I'm your host, Jamie Staples. This week we have Matt Savage on the podcast, legendary tournament director, and I do not use legendary lightly. I mean, this guy is the man. He knows tournaments. He's been doing it since the beginning of my poker time anyways, before that, I think 2002 or 2001. So we talk all sorts of things in the industry. We talk about the WPT World Online Championship coming up this summer, talk about coronavirus and COVID, uh, basically just cover everything when it comes to tournament poker. So really think you're gonna enjoy the conversation, but before we get to that, let's talk about some of the online poker news this week. We've got to kick off today's news segment with the World Poker Tour World Online Championship coming up this summer. I actually just made a video for this, so I'm going to plug the video. It's on my YouTube channel, uh, Poker Staples YouTube, because I went through the whole schedule, what I'm going to be playing, the events that are coming up. It's really cool. It's something that, if you're unfamiliar with the series, um, it it has three tiers in it, a 3300, a 320, and a 33. And basically what happens is there's one event a week, right? It's 3200, 320, 33, and that's it. So there's going to be a bunch of satellites into those events to get into that future event. And the event itself is a very slow structured and slow paced tournament, like a live tournament would be, right? Like when you go to the the casino and you're playing the World Series of Poker main event, for example, that's a moment. That's an experience, right? And what this WPT uh, is aiming to do is to recreate that same experience of today, I'm playing this tournament. You have lots of time to play. You start with a lot of big blinds uh, with massive guarantees, 100 million guaranteed over the summer. So um, really excited about this. There's a lot of ways to qualify uh, and satellite in for smaller buy-ins. Like into the 3200s, you can go 33 to 320 to 3200. Um, into the 1000 mini main event, you can play a $22 phase into that 1K buy-in. Uh, and for the main event, the 10,000 buy-in, 10 million guarantee, you can go 11, 109, 1K, 10,000. So you have a lot of ways to get in. It's gonna be an amazing, amazing summer of poker. You definitely wanna check it out, I'm telling you. WPT, World Online Championship this summer. I can't wait, I'll be streaming it. You gotta play. Also going on this summer, we have some competing series to this WPT World Online Championship. Over on GG Poker, there is the World Series of Poker Online running with 54 bracelets to be won. The main event of this series is a 5,000 buy-in with a 25 million guaranteed. Uh, there's going to be a, there's going to be multiple main event day ones beginning August 16th, uh, and there's also a series of micro and low stakes qualifying events starting on July 19th. Also over on Poker Stars, there's a stadium series as well where. Uh, there's like a bunch of phases into a weekend final, so some large guaranteed events over there. So we see the three biggest online sites in the world really going to war this summer and, uh, and creating some amazing events. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what players support and what players like. Uh, I mean, for me, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on the podcast, I think the WPT is designed perfectly for me. It's just like a perfect series. Um, but I, I know that GG and PokerStars will do some good things as well. So this is going to be a truly historic uh, tournament summer this year, one we've never seen before. Usually the summer is more of a lax time for poker. That is not the case with millions, hundreds of millions guaranteed across the felt. So uh, should be interesting. We'll be talking about it a lot over the coming podcasts. I can't wait to get in there. Next up for online news, we have Julian Strapoli. I have a brand new teammate, the Party Poker Team Online. Uh, has joined Party Poker Team Online. He is a French-speaking streamer, uh, currently based in Malta at the moment, and he has joined the team to help stream. Uh, so make sure you check him out if you speak French. You will love his channel. He joins uh, Clay as well, so there's two of them that speak French, uh, bolstering our offering for French speakers for Team Online. So uh, in 2019, Julian won the $1,000 Spring Championship of Online Poker event and reached uh, several final tables, including events in PowerFest and the Winamax series uh, when he was playing in France. So amazing stuff. Congratulations to Julian and welcome to the team, my friend. Excited to have one new member. Let's give a little shout out here. We have some podcast run good coming in, okay? Some gun we've had on the podcast actually won the Poker Masters Pot Limit Omaha main event. That would be Isaac Haxton for $675,000. Uh, I really remember his interview and his conversation because he, it, 
it came across to me like how intelligent this guy is. And, you know, you might follow him on Twitter or have seen him in media and you're just like, oh, yeah, obviously. You know, he's playing the biggest tournaments in the world, right? Like, he's probably a pretty smart guy. Uh, but it was, it was great to have that conversation with him on the podcast. And so it doesn't surprise me in the slightest he was able to take down this uh, Poker Masters PLO event. Congratulations to Ike Haxton on the win. Now let's get into the podcast here. Um, tournament director for the World Poker Tour since 2010. Um, he co-founded the Tournament Director Association. He was the leader for the WCP Tournament Directors in 2002-2003. He's done over 400 episodes of televised poker. This is the man when it comes to being a tournament director, and it was such a pleasure to speak with him. So without further ado, conversation with Matt Savage. Joining me on the podcast today, I have Matt Savage. Matt, thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, happy to be here. So I wanted to kick off, so someone told me coming into this that you actually were in alarm sales before you got into poker. I wanted to ask you, how, what happened there? How did you go from alarm sales to poker? Uh, basically it was, you know, I was an alarm technician and I wasn't very good with electronics. So, you know, I really can't fix anything, but uh, I was, uh, you know, I took the job because it was available. And uh, like I said, I wasn't very good at it, but at the same time, while I was driving around, I, I found the local card room. So, you know, I'd go there after work and, and sit and play, you know, low ball and, uh, you know, limit hold is what they had most of back in those days. And so I saw that the people that were working there were making a lot more money than the people that I was working with. So right. I figured it was a good uh, time to make the move. I enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, I've never really looked back. That That's awesome. I mean, that that's pretty cool. So in in the early stages of finding that card room and playing low ball and like, uh, being introduced to the game, you know, what made you think, hmm, I'm, I'm going to take the industry side here. Because for me as a player, when I saw it, I was like, oh, I want to be like those guys. So like, why did you go down the path of becoming a, a tournament director and a poker director? Uh, probably because I wasn't a very good player. So I knew that my path was going to be uh, career oriented, oriented. And, you know, the, I saw the people that were dealing were making more money than the people that were selling chips, which I, which I started as doing. Right. And then I saw that, uh, you know, people were going on the floor and assuming more of a management position. So that was seemed like a, a safer, smarter path for me to go. That's way more self-awareness than <laughs> like the whole industry. <laughs> like I, I'm very impressed that you you had that uh, thoughts when what how old were you in your in your life when this was happening? Uh, I was early 20s, early so 20s. yeah, so it was about 28 years ago. Uh, I was thinking about that the other day. About 28 years ago is when I started in this crazy profession called poker, and I uh, never really uh, wanted to do anything else after I started that, for sure. So I want to ask you about being a tournament director. Um, you you interact with, like, all of humanity. You know, one of the best things about poker, I think, is it's a universal language. It doesn't discriminate in terms of people being able to play and, and communicate. So you have to make rulings, uh, you know, across cultures. Uh, so I wanted to ask you if you had any sort of interesting or, or difficult moments in your career as a director. Like, does something stand out as like, that was a really hard spot? Um, anything come to mind? Well, I guess the first spot would be, you know, you know, trying to start something that nobody believed in, which was the Tournament Directors Association. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the day, I had uh, the opportunity to play a lot of events around the Bay Area where I was from, and the rules were different everywhere I went. So I, I figured that it was time for an industry like this, as big as it is and as big as it could be, uh, that uh, we would put together something that, you know, the rules would be standard for all tournaments. Because as a player, you know, it's very irritating when you go from one spot to another and the rules are different. So that was the first major step that I took was going to Vegas. First time I ever walked into the World Series of Poker was in 2001. Uh, and with the goal of standardizing the rules and because of, you know, their unwillingness to do it back then, I had to reach out to a good friend of mine at the time named Linda Johnson, who had come up to the Bay Area and played some of our events. And she had an industry conference back in the day called the World Poker Industry Conference. And she allowed me to put this on the tail end of her conference. And out of that, she joined the boards as did Jan, Jan Fisher and David Lamb. And uh, we started the TDA, the Tournament Directors Association. And so that was a kind of a, a major stepping stone in my career. And 
who knew that one year after walking into the WSOP for the first time, I would be running the WSOP the following year. And that was another tough decision because at the time, WSOP, uh, a lot of people felt like, and a lot of the players felt like it was over. People don't even realize that really? you know, the year between 2001 and 2002, there may not have been a WSOP. Uh, no way. The, the, the ownership of the casino, uh, Binion's Horseshoe, you know, was struggling financially. Uh, they didn't want to pay any advertisers. Um, you know, they didn't really, I wouldn't say they didn't care about it, but I don't think that they thought that the WSOP was profitable or going to be, you know, somewhere where they were going. And, and, and although it's been in the family forever, you know, the employees didn't really all get paid from the previous year. So it was a very tough decision for me to decide that, hey, do I want to go and work there uh, when it may not even happen and that uh, it may not, you know, carry on. And people had told me, including Linda Johnson, that I shouldn't take the job. I should just, you know, not do it. It's wow. not going to be good for me. And I have always said since that time, I said, Linda, even if they don't pay me, it's such a good stepping stone for my career that uh, I'm glad that I did it. And luckily I did get paid, but uh, I didn't get paid that much. But at the same time, I, I, I feel like it was, you know, the step that I needed in my career to get where I am today. That's fascinating that how, how different the world could have been, you know, like if just yeah. a few decisions go, didn't go right. our way, uh, everything could have been different. Yeah, definitely poker would not be where it is today if not for the fact that uh, the WSOP continued uh, from 2001 to 2002. You know, obviously we never would have had a lot of the things that we have today. But, you know, of course, you know, online poker may not have been as big and uh, the, the industry definitely would have been different. There's just no doubt about that. Do you, do you have any memories of before, like, um, before the Tournament Directors Association, uh, you co-founded that, like some of the rules and some of the local situations that were happening in some rooms, do you have anything that stands out as like wow. silly? <laughs> well, definitely there was, you know, in, the, in Northern California, they didn't even have a uh, dead button. The button always moved forward. Right. So when somebody busted out, that was kind of the first thing that I fought against myself. I wanted to keep it moving button. Everybody else in the world was doing it a different way or in the country was doing it a different way with a dead button. And so I found out early on that what we wanted to do in the TDA was to get everybody on the same page. Whether you agree with it or not, you want to get everybody on the same page. Uh, and so that was an important step for me to understand that uh, the goal that I wanted and that others wanted was to have the rules standardized. Whether you agreed it with it or not, if you could live with it and everybody was going to be doing it the same way, it'd be better for the players, it'd be better for the staff, it'd be better for the dealers. And because of that, that's kind of how the TDA really form, you know, formed what it was and what it is today. Right. So you mentioned you were the, uh, the tournament director for the World Series of Poker. Uh, I think that started 2002, um, but before the boom. So like, what was poker like back then for a guy like me? I got in in 2009, right? So like that, I, I hear that through stories and through reading Super System. Um, so for the younger guys and, and girls out there, you know, what, what was poker like and what was the World Series poker like back then? So I started off the World Series. I knew I was taking the job. I went to a few of the players I knew were problems uh, in the industry, like uh, Amen the Master, John Benetti, a couple others that I knew. And I said, look, I know in the past you've always gotten away with mistreating dealers and you know abusing other players and things like that. That's not going to happen under my watch. So that mm -hmm. was the first step that I took. And then the second thing was when the WSOP was starting, I said, okay, from now on, the tournaments are going to start on time. And so people hated it. You couldn't register late back then. You had to be there on time or else you missed the tournament. Uh, so that was another thing. And then I made the announcement this year at the World Series of Poker, there'd be non-smoking. So in previous years, you could actually smoke at the World Series of Poker. So I think those are the three big things that, uh, you know, going forward, I wasn't going to tolerate. So I think um, those were the major steps for me at the World Series of Poker and also for the players, because I think since that time, it's never really been the same. You know, I think that, you know, the dealer abuse, player abuse and stuff like that has been diminished. And I'd like to think that I had a big part of that. And obviously the no smoking has you know, been a rule pretty much every card room since then. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a great change for I think for the players and of course the employees that have to to be there every day too. So, yeah, I mean those are some of the major things that I saw that were different. But I think that um, the fact that it was also about the three hundred 
uh, same familiar players coming in every single day, maybe even 200 that would come and play all these events. You really didn't have a lot of people dropping in to play the other events. Sure, you'd have the people from the East Coast coming in to play the stud events or, you know, some other people coming from the Bay Area in Northern California to play the Omaha events. But for, for the most part, you know, there wasn't a lot of uh, different people just dropping in to play poker tournaments uh, back when I started in 2002 with the World Series. It's, it's crazy to think that that's 18 years ago. Cause that and seems also, like- Limit Hold'em was the biggest event of the series outside oh, of the main event. God. Limit Hold'em started off the World Series Poker. It was the opening event. It was the second biggest event every year prior to 2003. That's, it's, it's actually crazy how much we've changed as an industry. Cause that, yeah. that's, I mean, that's a different world to the one that I came up in in poker. Definitely. Um, Definitely. So, so you talked about innovations uh, with the uh, Tournament Directors Association. Uh, I know you've been a front runner for the um, button ante, right? The button ante. Big blind ante. Big blind ante. I got yes. that backwards. Okay, the big yeah. blind ante. Um, so I wanted to ask you, is there anything else that you would do if you could play sort of God in poker and you made all the decisions? Like, is there something you think tournaments will move towards in the future, but we're not doing yet or we're not ready yet you know like what would you choose for for tournament poker well specifically now uh, you know i really think that a lot of things that we're doing now with the reopenings of poker rooms um and i know we we're going to talk about this later but i think that a lot of the stuff we probably should have been doing before you know mm. if you if you're sick and you still want to go play poker which you probably shouldn't do in the first place you should have been wearing the mask right instead yeah. of uh, other players because they want to get sick, but you should be protecting other people. And people have already done this. You know, you see this in Asia all the time. The people that were wearing masks before wasn't because they didn't want to get sick from somebody else. It was because they were sick themselves. And of course, the hygiene, uh, you know, the washing of your hands and doing all those little things probably should have been been done before. The cleaning chips, the cleaning of the cards, you know, the, the making sure people have washed their hands and and are more sanitary that way. Uh, I think it's important for us for the future, but it, I think it's also something that should have been that way in the past. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, changes upcoming, but uh, also I think that this is a great learning experience for us in poker for the for the future as well. I think the first one I saw was John Jawanda. I think he won yeah. a tournament wearing Juwanda a mask, and that was yep. that was a moment for me. I was like, wow, that's okay, that's a thing. Um, right. You know, from from your perspective, what would you do in the current situation? If you ran a room, would would you open? Like, how do you feel about where the world is and playing poker right now? Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm in a really tough spot because, you know, I'm out there feeling a lot of questions from poker room managers and TDs and uh, dealers and players and everything. So it puts me in a real tough spot because I think that, uh, you know, it's tough for me to say, get, get on out there and open up when I may not be willing to do so myself, you know, right now. So yeah. it's uh, it's one of those things where I'm a true believer in the masks. I think that's vital. I think that that's something that, again, uh, needs to be done now and maybe should have been done before. But, you know, until we actually have a vaccine or a cure for, for this, I don't think that uh, it makes any sense. And not just for myself or for what I think. But I think if you have the common decency, you should be looking out for others. And if even if you don't feel like a mask helps, it makes other people feel safer, it makes them feel more secure. So I think that that's one of the things. But, you know, as far as poker rooms opening itself, you know, it's very tough for me to tell an owner of a casino or a card room, say, hey, he, you shouldn't be opening right now because they have not only their business to look after, but they also have a lot of employees. Uh, they have their players. They have everybody out there uh, that's looking on them to make next steps so that they can go back to work, so they can go back and play their favorite game, they can do all of those things. So for me, I think it's a tough one to, to say that I wouldn't want to be out there actively promoting and saying, come back right away as a player. But I think that people have uh, the rights to have the choice to come in and play if they want. So I think that also gives the uh, owners of these places and the uh, management of these places the right to open them up. So. Uh, I know that there's going to be some closures today uh, in California. People haven't even heard about that. But uh, the casinos that are opening up are, I think, going to be forced to close tonight uh, for two or three weeks. And if they do, I think you're going to see, you know, some others look at 
you know, what they're going to do to make sure it's safe because all these hotspots are, are popping up. But uh, yeah, it's a very tough decision for everybody that's involved. Uh, like I said, I don't feel like uh, promoting, you know, the fact that they're opening right now, but I am perfectly willing to give the facts of the things that are going on in these places. So I really, uh, you know, I think it's uh, people's personal choice if they want to go play, if they want to go back to work, and if they want to open. Yep. Well, well said. I, I like your perspective on it. Um, so you joined the WPT in 2010. Um, how did you get into that role? And then how have things changed over the last 20 years working with them? Well, I really like to feel like I've been there since season one, because in season one, we had an event in Lucky Chances Casino in Northern California where they had uh, an event. So I feel like I've been with the WPT since season one. Um, but I do think that, uh, you know, being with them in 2010, uh, they had reached out to me. And one of the issues was, is that I was doing so many different events for so many different uh, networks and the online sites and everybody that we had talked about even before that, but I really couldn't be exclusive to the WPT. So in 2010, when I took that more exclusive role, I, you know, grandfathered some of the events that I was already doing earlier. Um, but I've really enjoyed it because not only do I deal with the players, but I deal with the properties and the management teams and the TDs from all over the world. And I think that the, that's a role that I've really uh, thrived under and really been able to help a lot of people improve and get better. So I think that that's an important step for me to uh, to grow as a in my career and to grow as a person as well, because of all the great people I've met in this industry, it just has made it so much better for me to uh, expand my role. I, I was looking up some of your stats with the WPT and you've done over 400 televised uh, shows, basically. Be, being the, the director, the tournament director for 400 shows. Uh, is there yeah, any of those closer that, to 500 now? But yeah, closer. I mean, that's a lot. You know, that's a record. We know that for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, is is there any of those that stand out as like that was absolutely crazy? Any memorable uh, TV moments? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's been a lot over the years. Of course, being in Monte Carlo for the first time and being at those final tables where, you know, we held them in the Casino Monte Carlo and. Uh, yeah, those are definitely ones I remember filming a live show Thanksgiving Day with Phil Ivey won a million dollars uh, was a, a great memory. I always think about, of course, Bay 101 and those final tables uh, on the World Poker Tour were always times that I'll never forget. And Phil Helmuth uh, crying on the floor, you know, that was also a great memory for me. But, you know, of course, those final tables <laughs> at the WSOP as well. Uh, in 2004, I ended up even proposing to my wife at that WSOP final table. Uh, Norman Lon uh, broadcast a, a little clip where they, they gave me the odds of her saying yes or no. So it was, uh, those are the memories that I'll never forget. And obviously, I think there's definitely times in my career that uh, um, have been very special to me. You know, like I said, you know, even meeting my wife at the casino at Dominion's Horseshoe, uh, and we're still married today, 16 years later. Uh, it's been a great, uh, a great thing for me to meet people and, of course, uh, meet special people in my life as well. I know it's your wife's birthday today as well, so happy yes, birthday is. to her. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks for my taking some time today to today. do it. You got it, of course. <laughs> um, so you're, you're pretty active on social media. That's where I got introduced to you before I was, uh, had enough money to play any live events. Um, and you, you answer a lot of questions to help people with rules and recreational players. So what can casinos and poker rooms do to make newer amateur players feel more welcome to play the game? Yeah, definitely. It's social media presence, I think, has been very important for, for me, uh, not only to uh, stay in touch with new players, but to, to help those people that are new to the game. And, you know, I get a lot of people when somebody asks a question. Uh, that start to criticize that player. And you know Twitter the way it is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's unfortunate because I think that if the person's asking that question genuinely, they want to know the answer. And so they want to feel more comfortable going into these casinos and properties. I think you need to really make people feel comfortable. And, you know, throughout the years, people have not always been nice to the new player at the game. You know, they kind of criticize them, make fun. How could you play like that and stuff like that? I just really think that uh, the TDs out there, the, the card room managers, you know, the floor people need to protect new players, make them feel comfortable, learn their name, I think is one of the things that uh, I've always professed throughout my whole career is that you learn these people's names and you walk through the door and you say, hey, Jamie, how you doing today? And you kind of get a shock response because people 
don't really expect that, you know, mm. when you walk through there that, you know, them, you know, that, you know, maybe their situation, their family situation, whatever you can, you can relate to people on human level. And I think that p makes people feel really comfortable about coming into your property. And I learned this long ago from working at, uh, you know, smaller ish card rooms in California that, you know, if, if people come in and, and they, you get to know them, I think that that's one of the things that's really important, but definitely protect new players and, and uh, make them feel comfortable. I think that's most important. How do you do with the names, Matt? How do you remember all the names? Like, do you have any quick tips for me? Because I'm, yeah. I'm so bad with names. Yeah, I try to associate uh, people with names. Obviously, you know, you've, you've got a pretty recognizable name and make it easy, you know, uh, to do that. But yeah, I just, you know, you kind of think of somebody like, uh, you know, if, if I thought of Jamie, I would think of, I don't know, Jamie Kersetter, you know, because I know her, yeah, right? So right. I say, his name's Jamie also, right? So I it, I just associate it with somebody like maybe an actor or something like that and uh, try and put those two together. And so I think that it's one of those things that's it's, uh, it's vital, uh, it's a vital exercise for people. And I try and teach all my floor staff to do that. And uh, again, I just think it's so important to make people feel comfortable. I, I want the Matt Savage book to remember names in the future, please. That would be very <laughs> helpful. It. Jamie Kersetter, that's a nice, uh, I'm in good company there, though. That's <laughs> yes, good. Yes, you are. That's yes, good. You, are. you both um, have done a lot of great things for poker, so I think that's a, a good one to be associated with. Thank you. Um, you you've spoken previously about re-entries. It's a really popular debate online. Uh, I saw Rob Young was talking about it today in regards to party poker schedule. Um, so where do you stand on, on re-entries? Uh, what do you think for the, the live arena? And then even for online as well, what are your thoughts on re-entries? Again, puts me in a tough spot because I'm the one that kind of made them, popularize them, right? But when I originally came up with that in 2010, the goal was to get people to come back every day. You know, you couldn't re-enter the same day, you had to re-enter the following day. And we had a $335 buy-in tournament with a million guarantee, and at the time it was unheard of, right? To have such a small buy-in, but you, you know, could re-enter the following day. Mm -hmm. And it kind of caught on like wildfire to where people were doing it in the same session and the same heat. And, you know, then people came up with the impression that I did it so that you could make more rake, but that wasn't the case. The reason re-entry re was created was to bring people back to your property to get them into cash games or get them to play other events, sit and goes, use your property, use your hotel, your restaurants, those type of things to bring more people in. But I truly believe that it's gotten out of hand. I think that uh, single re-entry is the way to go if you're going to do anything. But, uh, you know, I, th uh, you know, one of the problems is that uh, us as operators, we see these big prize pools and it attracts more people to come to your event if you have the big prize pools. And so... I do think it's important that us as operators try and protect the players in some respect. Um, and I know that a lot of the players don't feel the same way because they're usually the top pros that are, you know, feasting on these people that are, you know, busting uh, all their bankroll in one tournament. So I think it's important that we do that. I did that with the LA Poker Classic this year. I made all the events single reentry only, and it went over very well. You know, obviously the numbers are going to suffer a little bit, but I think in the long run, I think it's important that we realize that what we're doing affects how the future comes. And, you know, once uh, this is all over uh, the COVID and people need to go back outside, I, I just hope that everybody has a little bit of money left after playing all these online events with multiple reentries and multiple events. And, you know, thank, thank God that we have Rob Young, who's also a very big player advocate for the game and, and doing so many great things with party poker that's looking out for these things. So, you know, it's a tough one. It's uh, definitely something that I'll look back on my career of, of was it a mistake or not to try and popularize these things. But uh, I want to make sure that, you know, the game is secure going forward, you know, whether, uh, you know, when I retire or not, you know, I want to make sure that it's in good hands and that people that are in these positions are making the correct decisions. So, uh, you know, it's, it's not everybody's on my side on this and not all the players are on my side on this, but I do think that uh, reentry has truly gotten out of hand. Yeah. I don't think you can blame yourself because I think it, it would have happened eventually. It makes sense. People wanting to play the same tournament, but you know, we have seen it abused and I worry about it myself as a player because I think people like yourself look far into the future and are worried about the health of the game. And certain operators are really worried about the health of the game and making long-term decisions. But then some may not be, you know, they might have other, other verticals where they're successful and they're able to just make more aggressive decisions to maximize their bottom line right away. Um, do, do you see any way around the, 
the business part of poker and like how to unite when some of the decisions cause short-term loss in, in potential profit. You know, like how do you convince company A to make this move for the good of poker long-term? Have you given yeah, any that, thought to that idea? Of course, yeah. And that's, that's part of the problem is that, uh, you know, you and I and, and others see that as trying to protect the game for the future. But we have seen so many people come into this game and go from the game, you know, and the strong are going to survive. I think the party pokers, you know, the poker stars, things like that are going to survive. And, and so, you know, the, the, the poker boom of trying to come in and make a quick buck on it, I think is gone. I think that we need to work together. I know that, you know, people even with your, with uh, party poker have talked about it, you know, uh, um, Patrick Leonard talked about uniting and make some kind of, of organization with the players to make sure that uh, these things are looked after. It's a tough one. You know, I would, you know, I would welcome anything like that to happen. I, I just think that uh, it's something that is probably important for the future of the game. But at the same time, I know it's very tough because there are still those around that are trying to make, uh, you know, trying to make money quick, uh, trying to make it while they can. And uh, it's, it's one of those things that's a tough decision as a business uh, to try and, you know, curtail what you make today so that you'll have something long term. Right. It's a tough problem. It's a tough problem. <laughs> it's a, tough it's problem. Uh, Definitely. A, a lot of similar sort of thoughts on that in this podcast, I think so. Well, we um, need you guys like you and, you know, Patrick and others to, to do these things to, to lead the way. And like I said, you have my support and I think that uh, I have definitely have a voice in the game. So, uh, Good luck to you. I, I hope you can do it. I, I, I face the same challenges with the TDA, so I understand that uh, it's not that easy. But uh, again, mm -hmm. you can pull it off. Good luck to you. <laughs> I want to ask you a, a question about four players as well, because uh, you interact with the most players, maybe of anyone in the world, right? <laughs> so um, if, if you could give a piece of advice to, to the regular players out there, and the poker players to for the good of the game what would you tell them i'd tell them stay within your your level right i mean people that are out there and you know trying to get into these uh you know it happens at every level i have people that play you know five cent ten cent or you know 25 cent 50 cent online and they're comfortable playing there but it's very hard when you jump up in levels like for me it was early on in my my life i was playing two and four limit right Next mm -hmm. thing I know, I was playing three, six, six, twelve, and then when I got to ten, twenty, I never wanted to go back, right? I think that's always a tough step for people to go back, and I applaud and have always worked really hard for the satellite programs to try and get people to win this life-changing money through satellites and through smaller buy-ins. I think that's an important way to uh, to look at things that you know you want to keep people you know in their buy-in level where they're comfortable and to where they don't leave the game because they feel like they have you know stepped back too far and some people feel like you know once i've achieved this level like even you see it all the way at the top levels people that you know once played all the you know uh thousands and fifteen hundred dollar events uh and occasionally played a ten thousand if they satellite it in jumped up to the twenty five thousand dollar level and now you don't see them in those other tournaments at all ever mm. right they feel like it's beneath them and i feel like that's a big problem for the game obviously because you know, you have those stars of the game and when they used to play everything, right? All these guys used to play the $300 events, the $200 events, and it was more of a, a, a friendly atmosphere, ecosystem where you could see and play with your heroes. A lot of times you can't do that anymore. You and I, well, maybe you can, but I couldn't play with Brent Kenny anymore, right? It just right. doesn't happen. You know, I invited him to be a shooting star at the $5,000 event. It, you know, it's just too small for him. He doesn't have any interest in playing in that. So, you know, part of the allure of the game was that you could play with the live. You could play with anybody. You could play with anybody in the game. And now you just can't. So I think that's a, a, another part of the game that needs to be protected. And I, I wish that some players understood that and understood how important their role is to further the game. And I just don't think we have that in a lot of people's psyche to do that. It has it has spread out. We've seen it widen, I, I think, for sure. Um... I think back to playing live cash myself and the two five game of the casino I used to play was just the worst. There's nine sharks sitting down because there's no one else playing, right? The game had dried up. And then there's all these beautiful one, two games where everyone's 500 deep and it's just like, but that was their level. And right. you know, and they were, they were missing out on the good games. I, I remember yeah. something very similar. 
Um, sure. So I, I want to leave on just a very simple question because I saw a tweet yesterday. Um, how's the golf game? <laughs> uh, the golf game is getting better. I was really struggling in the really early part of COVID, but uh, now it's coming back. I uh, went straight up to a 17 and everybody thought I was sandbagging and you know trying to get my handicap up for my golf tournament coming up, but it's dropped all the way right back down to 13. So I'm, I'm right in my level. You know, I've never been much better than this and I've never been much worse uh, in the last 10 years. So the golf game's good. I'm happy that uh, golf courses are open and we can get outside and at mm -hmm. least there's something we can do, you know, and I, I do, I urge everybody that goes out to think of others. That's uh, my main thing and think of others and put that mask on. I don't think it's that difficult to do. Makes sense. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time today. Uh, I really appreciate it. I think I first met you at the WPT Deep Stacks, I think it was. I think that was the, that was the first one. But I always knew that was that's the guy. That's the tournament guy. <laughs> so I've always looked up to what you've done in the game. Thanks so much for taking the time and uh, speak again soon. Thanks, Jamie. Great to talk to you. And uh, anytime. You guys are uh, doing great work uh, with Party Poker. And I'm happy to see that uh, we have this big WPT event coming up, uh, 100 million guaranteed, and not that many reentries. So I'm excited for you, the team, Rob. And, uh, you know, I'm excited and hope it is a huge success like I think it will be. Awesome. Thanks, man. All right. Thank you. Big thanks to Matt for taking the time on his wife's birthday as well. I mean, that's commitment. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate it. Now, before I let you all go, we have our weekly competition, our hashtag JSPokerHero. All you have to do is tweet out an answer to this question using that hashtag, JSPokerHero. You can tag me as well, at Jamie Staples. Why not? I like to see your guesses. And you could win yourself one of two $109 direct satellites into the 1K mini WPT main event. The one we talked about, 5 million guarantee, 1,000 buy-in. You don't want to miss it. So two of these 109 satellites. I think they gave me one, and we're doing two. Sorry. Sorry, Party Poker. I already said it. It's it's happening. Two seats, okay? Now, last week's winner, congratulations to Ashley Yearwalker, who correctly guessed one of the names of the Ragnarok characters by answering Odin. So you win two $109 Party Poker main event tickets. Congratulations for that. This week, the WPT mini main event satellites start tomorrow. There are 109 direct dollar satellites running every night to win 1,050 tickets. How many seats are guaranteed per night? Use the hashtag JSPokerHero. You can find this in my YouTube video as well. I didn't, I didn't design this question. They gave me this question. I didn't even think of this one, but I'm using it as a plug to send you to the video on the WPT coming out this summer. Thank you all so much for listening to the podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to drop a rating and a comment on iTunes, Spotify, you just do your thing, and YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, would be much appreciated. Thank you all so much for taking the time, but until next week, we'll see you later.